Good evening. I'd like to welcome you to the discussion about human dignity in the workplace. My name is Fatimi Kojinaiki. I'm a journalist and I'm responsible for uh, communication of Human Rights 360. And I am uh, here to moderate uh, the platform of the Future of Work and the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung uh, and especially the Athens branch. The platform is also an initiative of uh, the uh, Friedrich Ebert Stiftung and Rethink Republic rather, the Republic. And so thank you very much uh, for being with us today in order to unfold this very interesting discussion. At least we hope that will be the case. Before we continue and I introduce the speakers to you, I would like to request of Mr. Anish Yudberg, who is the director of uh, the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung in Athens, to uh, address you. You have the floor now. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our today's event, Dignity in the Workplace, which is jointly organized by Friedrich Ebert Stiftung and Republic, the progressive think tank in Greece. And this event is also part of our project Future of Work, which is promoting the public debate on the changes driven by green transition, globalization, and digitization. Throughout the last weeks, we have seen the development of a strong Me Too movement in Greece, and we want to expand the focus of this debate by looking at conditions in the workplace. We want to discuss what should be done to create a secure workplace and equal chances in the workplace for everybody. When preparing our event, we found three questions of particular importance. What do we mean by the term decent work? And what does it mean in addition to better and fair payment? How is the situation in different countries? And what can we learn from other countries? Which mechanisms can we find or demand on the level of the firm in order to promote decent work and anti-discrimination? Finally, I think we can confirm that FES and Republic want all people to unite to do our utmost to fight discrimination in the workplace against all kinds of vulnerable groups. And we believe that there is no trade-off in our find, fight for class discrimination and discrimination of vulnerable groups. We can always aim at fighting for better payment and against discrimination at the same time. Now we are looking very much forward to the debate on the podium, and we are looking very much forward to reading about your opinions and questions on the chat and on our Facebook page. Thank you very much for joining us. I too would like to thank uh, Mr. Schildberg, who actually sets the basic pillars of this debate. So we want to broaden uh, in a way the METO movement and to examine and consider whether when we talk about um, dignified work, uh, we include the issues of respect of personality or for the separate identities of uh, working uh, people. So aside from a dignified payment and the working hours, uh, who, which are um, essential issues, we need to go beyond that because um, their uh, presence uh, does not um, constitute uh, the only form of uh, dignified workers. So before I introduce you to our, um, I guess uh, I'd like to say without further ado that today's um, event does not uh, have the conventional form of um, initial um, presentations and um, uh, positions. So we'll have a more interactive discussion. I will put uh, forward uh, the um, main questions and we'd like to ask you in turn to put your questions on Facebook and the two uh, pages where you can uh, follow our discussion. So I will um, proceed to the introductions with us. We have uh, Ms. Gabrielle Bischoff, a member of the European Parliament uh, with the Progressive Alliance of uh, Socialists and Democrats uh, group. Um, good afternoon, Ms. Bishop. 
We have also with us Mr. Spiros Vrivas, a specialist uh, occupational doctor. Good afternoon. And Ms. Eli Varhalama, legal advisor for ESA, the Trade Unions Federation. Now, I think that with our guests, uh, we'll be able to cover a broad spectrum of the parameters pertaining to the subjects to be debated, which is none other than uh, safeguarding and making sure that there is human dignity in the workplace. So, I move on directly to the first uh, question. And Mr. Bishop, I turn to you. You have uh, a vast um, occupational experience in several uh, professional um, areas, and you do have a picture of uh, the unions in such uh, areas. Uh, so we'd like to ask you to share with us uh, your impression vis-a-vis -vis the subject uh, that we've been discussing today. Thank you very much for the invitation to this debate. And indeed, um, I have also a long experience in trade unions. And for me, it is as essential as all the other goals uh, of the trade union movement is to make sure that everywhere, that everyone has the right to work in a secure work in a safe place uh, where he or she is not discriminated and that therefore is most inclusive. And uh, looking at this history, I think uh, we went a long way in, in this issue. Um, when I um, started to think about to participate in this debate, it came to my mind that uh, as a young student, I started already to work for trade unions. And one of my first pay job was to write a documentary on the first conference ever on sexual harassment in the trade union movement. And this was the case because at that time, there were some incidents happening in these trade union schools and centers and women were not... Um, they, they were not willing anymore to see this as individual problems and to address it. And I think what we can see also on European level is that uh, we already have now a legal framework. We have uh, directives from European level um, on decent work in the workplace against sexual harassment. Um, we also have a lot of national legislation uh, following this European directives, but still when we look at the reality and uh, I'm looking at a survey that the EU Agency for Fundamental Rights did some years ago, we can see that still more than 50% uh, of women experience sexual harassment in their workplace and that there is still a long way to go to make sure that uh, from a legal framework that in the end we also can really guarantee um, that we have safe workplaces and that we make sure that no one is discriminated or in, in any form has to experience um, these, um, these uh, kind of, of harassments. And I think for me, this is, the promise of the European Union is to improve the working and living conditions of the citizens in Europe. And for me, this is an elemental part of it because we realize it's happening everywhere. It's happening in the homes, it's happening on the streets, it's happening at the workplace. Maybe I leave it with this as an introductory remark. So, uh, and, and I finish with um, the, the title I gave to this first documentary was Trade Unions Are No Islands, uh, to underline that what is happening statistically everywhere um, is, is something we have to address wherever we work uh, and, and we are.
Σας ευχαριστώ θερμά, κυρία Μπίσοφ. Thank you very much, Mrs. Bishop. This is a very good overview. I think it will be very interesting indeed to uh, revert. To be honest, I'm going to change uh, the order. I was going to go to Mr. Dribas, but as we talked about trade unions, and this is a live discussion, and because Mrs. Eliva Halama has a huge uh, experience and uh, knows in depth the framework in Greece, I'd like following on your response to ask her, what is in fact um, the overview of the day-to-day -day, uh, work reality in Greece, in Greece, where we're talking now? Do we see uh, convergences with what Ms. Bishop said? Is it a different island in order to use that figure of speech? Mrs. Varkhalama, you have the floor. Could you please uh, tell us more about this? Well, good uh, evening. Thank you for the invitation. I'd like to convey the warm greetings from the president of ESA. The overview that we have for this phenomenon is in fact uh, different when we have a global forum, different on a European level and different uh, on a national level. And we see that uh, it can also be different from region to region within the country. Now, let's talk about Greece specifically. At present, the overview that we have in the trade unions, the central ones, because you know that um, our uh, way of organization is similar to Germany and different from other member states, we see that this is, in fact, uh, quite uh, habitual or commonplace as a phenomenon, phenomenon, but it's uncharted. So we see that uh, there seems to be a lot of uh, issues in the uh, public discourse, but there's no official record of this uh, public discourse with the, the uh, denunciations and also with the uh, court orders. So it's very important that this publicity has been given and uh, to a great extent recently, it's very important to break the silence. And this has in fact, uh, given the possibility for uh, women primor uh, primordially, but also men to speak out. Uh, it's also a gendered issue, but um, I think we will take this as a point a bit later. Now, we see that even though a lot of light has been shed on it and uh, people are speaking out, but there is not a similar light shed on protecting the victims. So this is still a dark subject. And they, we don't know why the victims don't actually uh, take recourse and uh, fight for the rights. And okay, we know that, um, especially in the workplace, it's very difficult because um, the worker finds it very difficult to go to justice in the wider sense. So there, we have to uh, see why we don't have evidence and whether the mechanisms are operating correctly. What I wanted to say that we do see that uh, this has uh, a widespread incidence of such a phenomenon that is, but uh, we don't see that the victims can, in fact, access the uh, protection mechanism. Thank you very much for this overview. We were going to come back to it and uh, ask more specific matters. Mr. Drivas, now, I want to give you the floor now. You're an occupational doctor. You're a specialist doctor in this field. I would imagine that recently we have, in fact, more reports whereby people come and talk about the bullying uh, that they've uh, been subjected to and various very difficult uh, situations and they might consult you as to what they should do. But before we actually go to your personal experience, let's talk about the uh, consequences for a person who is uh, subject to bullying at the workplace and how the employees are in fact affected. Could you please uh, tell us about your day-to-day -day work experience from the sector? Yes, well, good afternoon. Thank you very much, Ms. Kokinagi. 
First and foremost, I'd like to point out that this is not a new phenomenon. In the past 20 years, we've been receiving and seeing employees uh, who address themselves to specialists, occupational doctors, uh, um, reporting um, occupational violence, abuse or harassment uh, cases because uh, sexual violence, sexual harassment is uh, included in uh, the general harassment group but where we use the term mobbing that is uh, psychosomatic violence within the workplace um, and bullying for um, out of work areas. Um, so the consequences or the uh, risks uh, belong to psychosocial uh, factors or from the workplace. Let us put things in order here because we need to identify the risks. We need to identify the consequences of such risks, which leads to diseases, disorders, etc. And this will allow us to depict the Greek reality and propose and recommend solutions. So, such psychosocial factors are none other than the result of an interaction of uh, the labor relations, the industrial relations, and the needs of the employees, always within the framework of uh, the social and economic conditions uh, characterizing this uh, production, uh, productive uh, processes. In times of crisis, there are also there's also a series of factors that uh, further aggravate the situation. We have um, the reduction of pay that will lead to the uh, lack of satisfaction, labor insecurity, uh, health insecurity, which in general leads to fear for our health, uh, fear for uh, our um, relatives' uh, health, uh, the limitation and restriction of social life through the lockdowns, uh, teleworking, all these are factors that uh, influence um, individuals by creating um, stress, uh, discomfort, uh, distress, uh, uh, negative uh, performance, uh, uh, loss of income. Uh, in the family um, environment, uh, we have um, uh, an interaction um, where we see uh, also La loss of um, services provision um, uh, accompanied by a serious cost. We have an increased cost of uh, social security and several devious, uh, deviant behaviors. How is all this expressed? What is the result of uh, these factors? We have occupational stress, uh, the mobbing syndrome, as well as the uh, uh, burnout syndrome stress in general, well, signifies the reaction of the body against uh, an excessive stimulus. Occupational stress um, indicates uh, the contrast uh, between uh, the labor, the workplace environment and uh, the ability of employees to respond to these. Um, there are certain examples. So there are uh, risks and threats creating stress. Uh, um, quick working uh, rate of work, uh, which is uh, dictated by others. Um, mismatch uh, between uh, the requirements uh, for work and uh, the skills. Uh, occupational violence. Uh, we have um, manifestation of symptoms of both physical symptoms and psychological symptoms. Uh, of course, we should also talk about psychological violence uh, and mobbing. I don't know if uh, I am allowed to refer to mobbing. Yes, please do so. I don't know if you want to do it now or in due course. If uh, it's going to be a very brief presentation, yes. Well, mobbing on its own is not a disorder, but it is a procedure of repeated practice or exercise of violence of at least six months through several assaults or attacks that um, 
include uh, accusations, uh, charges, slur, uh, actions uh, that uh, affect uh, the professional um, image of the victim, always within the framework of uh, industrial relations. So this repeated uh, exercise of violence, uh, either within or outside uh, the organization, uh, can be manifested um, with words, gestures, uh, the different types of um, organization of work, etc. All these aims at uh, insulting uh, personality and dignity and even the um, psychological integrity, creating a, a derogatory uh, environment. Mobbing is uh, across the line. Uh, we can have um, uh, mobbing from the superiors to the employees or from uh, uh, e equal uh, employees. So this uh, leads to negative consequences uh, for employees. We have a negative uh, cost, loss of performance. Uh, the performance of uh, those who are subject to mobbing uh, might be lower by 80% uh, even um, as compared to their skills. Depending on their resistance to occupational stress and their uh, attention span. The results is uh, that employees uh, find it difficult to concentrate, uh, they have reduced uh, stress uh, resistance, um, uh, difficulty to uh, fall asleep, uh, um, depression, etc. In such cases, we need to proceed to specific interver interventions uh, to tackle these situations. Um, and of course, I can enter into further detail later on. Thank you very much. I will come back to you as to the other speakers as well. I want to tell you that I am of the impression that in this very short, so brief um, uh, time, you have given us the broader picture, which is quite grim. Um, but at the same time, we have um, either experienced such um, situations or we have heard about uh, people who have um, experienced such uh, behaviors. So what I'm thinking right now is that um, mobbing in all its forms is an entire universe and uh, that it spurs different reactions, um, chain reactions, and we need to intervene. Of course, this is of the essence, but we'll see this in due course. Now I will go back to Ms. Bischoff. What I wonder, and I think it's uh, worth discussing, aside from, our, uh, from uh, the personal uh, view you shared with us out of your personal experience, is what is the reality uh, right now abroad, uh, both at the level of the European uh, Parliament as well as in uh, the countries abroad. That is, I wonder whether there are specific uh, regulations or provisions and whether there have been cases uh, that um, uh, you know of and how uh, have they come uh, to be publicized. Thank you very much. Yes, so let me first explain a little bit the situation in the European Parliament. Um, as you know, we are 705 um, members of parliament and we have a huge apparatus of people working in this parliament, not only the assistance of the parliamentarians, but also a lot of people that are essential that we can all do our job. And I mean, uh, when you look at um, harassment, you can see it has often to do with a power imbalance. And, uh, and therefore, as you can see uh, in, in a parliament, uh, especially if you see the role of assistants, they are very essential on one hand for the members of parliament to do their job, but they are also very dependent 
and they are often working in very stressful situations. Um, and there were a number of cases uh, in the European Parliament, and this did uh, lead uh, to different measures the European Parliament did take um, to address this. And the first thing is, uh, and, and this is due to an initiative of, of uh, assistance um, that we're organizing in a network to address the problems, um, to, together also with the staff representation, is that before the elections now, it starts with that they ask every candidate to sign a charter against harassment and uh, on the well use. And what we have is with this period um, that every member of the parliament is asked to participate in a seminar that is on one hand a kind of, of training to understand that the parliament sort of has a zero tolerance policy against any form of harassment. Um, and also to understand what harassment is um, and also to get to know what will happen <laughs> If, if you uh, go against uh, this zero tolerance uh, policy. And uh, we have now different two bodies, an advisory committee on harassment and its pre preventation at the workplace that deals with cases of harassment between all staff members, including also, you know, we have a, a, a huge number of trainees also and also on cases that was referred to also by Mr. Drivers uh, on the same level between different, uh, for example, assistants. And we have a second advisory committee and that is dealing with harassment complaints concerning members of the European Parliament. Um, and that deals really exclusively with cases. And, uh, and we have a policy in the Parliament also that MEPs um, will be sanctions in cases of harassment. They will be reported to these committees, they will be dealt with, and then there will be proposals. And I have to say, we had first cases recently, where then uh, one of the consequences is that, that these members will be called out in the plenary for indecent behavior, and also the daily allowances will be cut for a certain period. And, uh, and there are either, uh, even harder sanctions if, if things like this then doesn't stop, but would continue. And this was necessary and only possible really because these uh, assisted networks and the staff reported these cases and uh, and insisted really, uh, and we had resolutions in the parliament to to change the environment and to make sure that this is not just declaratory, but uh, that really initiatives uh, will be taken on the different levels. And I think um, this is uh, very important and also uh, at different staff levels, um, you can take place in different training courses um, also uh, because prevention is also a very important area um, here. And this was also because the parliament uh, was always a pushing. If we look at the, if the look at the anti-discrimination directives, the parliament was a key driver to have better protection here. Um, and also in terms, if you look, for example, on the directive from the year 2002 uh, on the principle of equal tra tra treatment for men and women, and this covers all areas, employment, vocational training, promotion, working conditions, and also with the definition, I think for the first time on a European level, uh, what what is harassment and on the obligation also of employers 
um, to prevent situations like this. And this did not refer only um, to all people employed, but also you have special situations if you have customers coming in and they could also um, be responsible for harassment. So to cover all situations and then to implement this directive on national level, at least in Germany, um, this did lead uh, really to uh, to um, a structure established on anti-discrimination on national level where people can also uh, address to with complaints. Um, and I think in a couple of member states, this had quite a positive effect. But what we can see is also that, for example, we have it right these days in Berlin, uh, also uh, with regards to the Me Too movement, we have a new scandal in a, in a theater in Berlin. Also in relations that, where there is a big power gap and, and, uh, and, uh, and their harassment, but also discrimination uh, on, uh, of women regarding their age. Um, and uh, getting certain roles. So I think um, this is this is something where we have the message from society not to accept it anymore and not to be quiet about it and not to only address it sort of anonymously, but uh, women coming together, also men sometimes, uh, in an environment where there are problems and to address it publicly and... Uh, and to come up with proposals and expect uh, direct reactions uh, to, to make sure that to have a safe environment. And I think here trade unions also play an important role um, because um, to support this, um, this culture of zero tolerance, um, to have structures where women can complain to, because what we see is uh, also in a lot of surveys that um, we have in this research on European level showed that more than 30% of women didn't talk to anyone about incidents. A majority did, but mainly to friends and to family. Um, there is a high reluctance really um, often to do it uh, at the workplace or in the work environment or to authorities. I think police was rather 4% or, or something to address it. So to make it easy to do complaints and to address cases, because as Mr. Drivas also referred to, there are huge costs for society if you have a climate where you don't go against these kind of harassments um, because the consequences are not just individual consequences, but also for, for company, for society. Uh, and therefore, it's very important to create an environment uh, to address uh, harassments uh, and all kinds of mobbing. Σας ευχαριστώ πάρα πολύ. Ε, βλέπω ότι συγκλίνω... Thank you very much. I think that um, the axis uh, of uh, the subjects converge. Um, there's a common theme. This is why I would encourage you to engage into an interaction between um, yourselves in case you have questions for other speakers as well. Now we'll go back to Ms. Varkalama. And I will uh, refrain from um, putting other questions. Uh, both uh, Mr. Drivas and uh, Ms. Bishop uh, earlier referred to the need for prevention of such phenomena. Not only to the need, but also another need to make them public, to stop being quiet about it. So we need to encourage victims to speak up. 
and there is the huge need of prevention. So I wonder if in Greece the existing legal framework can safeguard or can see to it that such phenomena are prevented or whether it is adequate and sufficient in order for victims to feel safe to proceed to speak out be it on cases of uh, bullying or mobbing or sexual harassment. Yes, thank you. This is uh, a bit uh, provoking and I have a small comment. In Greece, as well as in other countries in the EU and uh, other countries around the world, uh, the working class, um, working people have um, been subject to multiple crises. That is, uh, workers in Greece uh, have uh, seen 10 years of uh, financial crisis and austerity measures, uh, followed by a health crisis with further restriction of um, their employment rights and labor rights. Let me tell you that um, certain measures uh, have been uh, obligatory uh, for reasons of protection of um, uh, public health, but also we have um, a financial crisis. Uh, there have also been uh, discriminations. Uh, we had uh, the refugees issues um, and all this led uh, to uh, discrimination against uh, refugees and immigrants. Uh, this whole environment, uh, uh, the uh, financial uh, crisis uh, adjustment in two years, in 10 years, in the past 10 years, uh, led to the uh, individualization of uh, the working conditions um, aiming at uh, uh, cutting the cost of work. And this led to isolation, this uh, individual regulation and settlements um, led to an isolation. During the health crisis, we had uh, a different kind of isolation for reasons of public health. All this within uh, a very flexible and deregulated environment. In my view, it's mostly deregulated. All this led for many other reasons as well, um, due to low payments. Um, all this led to the isolation of victims. Therefore, they have no easy access to denunciation uh, procedures. Uh, Therefore, you can understand that when we have isolated workers, prevention is a bit difficult. Prevention is one step before denunciation. It goes before that. So we need to know whether there is respect of dignity, etc. So when we have this isolation, this can't be confirmed. This is an environment which is targeted, which is actually formed on purpose. Uh, those of us working in uh, the areas of uh, rights, etc., uh, we find that uh, there are many counter incentives for victims to take recourse to authorities, uh, to uh, justice, etc. So, at the level of uh, prevention well i don't know whether we can talk about the correct application of prevention since there is this sense of impunity as long as there are no recourses of victims to justice as long as there are no sanctions be them administrative well, through fines or uh, court rulings etc then there's impunity therefore there is tolerance there are employees uh, in the show uh, area, in the show uh, or entertainment area. So um, people uh, working there for rehearsals, etc., aren't even getting paid for that. Uh, and they have no contracts signed for rehearsals. Uh, therefore, if they are for victims, they cannot take recourse to 
justice, uh, sports, uh, um, the sports field uh, also is uh, vulnerable. So within this framework, yes, of course, we can have prevention through public campaigns, uh, through messages, uh, and the media shedding light to the part of uh, denunciations and complaints, etc. It can also work through the culture. Let us not forget that in Greece, one of the important major consequences of the financial crisis was uh, the weakening of the collective um, uh, contracts. Uh, the collective uh, bargaining of uh, contracts, uh, because this would allow for a, a common safety net. Uh, when there is no such safety net, in cases where there already exist issues of uh, inequality, discrimination, etc., therefore this all is receding. This culture within the, the uh, workplace is no longer alive, given that 99% of businesses in Greece are SMEs. We have a sectoral approach. There is no corporate culture. Therefore, uh, the relations are interpersonal, at an interpersonal level. This uh, is uh, quite interesting. Uh, the, uh, legal, the legislative uh, framework should identify gray zones, gray areas, uh, which points are obscure. For instance, what happens with uh, uh, foreigners? Can they easily have access to the labor inspectorates uh, to uh, denounce something? Um, do all people have access to the labor inspectorate? For instance, we have so many islands in Greece. Um, can people working in the islands uh, have access to, to the labor inspectorate? Uh, is there a easy access to such processes and procedures? Therefore, my quick answer is that in order to have prevention, I need to have a better uh, unified single framework, which would entail better access to services. And the last remark, uh, the latest uh, report uh, of, from the ILO experts uh, on uh, labor contracts is a very extensive one. Well, they're asking for data from Greece. Uh, they ask us to give them uh, data, etc., on uh, discriminations, etc. So it would be wise, I think, uh, uh, if we could lift the barriers and the difficulties and share with them such uh, data. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Vahalama. And I really thank you because we talked about the broadening of the spectrum of the discussion, as I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation. Now, with what you shared with us uh, right now, not only did you pinpoint at the background of our uh, discussion, but you also shared with us a very realistic uh, picture as to what happens in different uh, working areas, workplaces. Thank you very much for your intervention. Now, before I move on to Mr. Drivers, um, to whom I will address my next question, I'd like to point out that uh, in a few seconds, You'll be able to see in our page uh, in the future of work um, what page and uh, the Friedrich Herbert Stiefel uh, page um, on Facebook. You'll find a, a question which you are called to answer. Your answers uh, will be considered for the future because um, right now we've been talking about human dignity in the workplace, but at the same time, there are many hot issues, um, searching upon our daily lives, and uh, the organizers would be interested in uh, discussing this. So please vote uh, about the subject of uh, the next public uh, discussion, which is going to be organized um, by the foundation. So Mr. Drivas, I come back to you. And I have the following question. Earlier, you said that uh, 
you have been talking to uh, people about uh, different types of uh, abuse, of uh, harassment, etc. As a specialist, occupational uh, doctor, what are your proposals and recommendations to uh, companies and businesses who would like to support their employees? If employers turn to you trying to safeguard uh, the dignity of such people working for them, what would you tell them to do? Before I answer your question, I'd like to say something which has to do with Mr. Barcalamas's uh, speech. Mrs. Barcalama, you have uh, talked about uh, how concerned you are about whether we can provide good legal support to victims of harassment. So if this concern is in fact expanded, we will see that it will be transformed into a psychosocial burnout because this is what burnout is. So on the one side, we have uh, ever-increasing social inequalities, and uh, we see that uh, circumstances make it necessary to um, actually intercede and provide care. But there's an inability to actually provide this uh, care and to uh, fulfill the needs. So that means that uh, we are in a contradictory phase. And this gives rise to the burnout syndrome. Now, I'd like to come back to your question. What should we do? If we understand that mobbing and harassment are, in fact, uh, part of the psychosocial factors of the workplace, we have to identify in the workplace environment those psychosocial factors in order to uh, be able to uh, tackle them. The 2008-2009 National Collective Bargaining Agreement in Article 7 talks about work stress. And it gives a set of measures, but unfortunately, very few of these measures have been put in place. But reference to work stress is very important, and I am going to actually yeah, keep it. It's important because it gives us the possibility to have it recognized officially, not only by scientists, but generally in a collective bargaining agreement, that there is this uh, detrimental factor called work stress. So. We have to find the yeah, psychosocial offensive factors. And how can the occupational doctor, employer, and workers actually uh, go about it? We have law 3850 of 2010, which has to do with the written assessment of uh, the work hazard. And this is something that the occupational physician has to do together with the uh, safety officer and the workers' representative, within it hides those uh, uh, factors that uh, impair our mental health. So until now, we did not find these harmful factors uh, on the psyche. And uh, we didn't consider it, um, in fact, part of our uh, mindset to identify them because afterwards we had to actually handle the morbidity that would be generated by these uh, detrimental factors. These factors um, have to do with uh, the content of work and pertain to the workplace. So when we analyze the workplace environment, we have to focus exactly on that, the organization and the content of work and not the individual with the problem. Well, of course, this is in quotation marks, because uh, nowadays we tend to focus on the person that supposedly has a problem, and that is the victim of harassment. Thus, in order to be able to have an effective assessment, we must have the active participation of the workers. We have to inform all workers 
about what these psychosocial uh, factors are and what uh, these detrimental factors cause and to provide solutions. It is only thus that we can actually identify the psychosocial detrimental factors and to provide or provoke, propose solutions on how to eliminate them in the workplace environment. But Mrs. Cookie, thank you, there is a problem here that has to do with the occupational morbidity. We said that uh, the uh, uh, psychosocial detrimental factors and harassment cause specific uh, um, work-related uh, diseases um, and illnesses amongst the people who work. There's no possibility to identify, diagnose and record these, not only those that have to do with the psychosocial detrimental factors in the workplace, but also the other commonplace work-related uh, uh, disorders, whether it's deafness uh, that is related to work, it's not actually identified often as an occupational disease and recorded as such. Unfortunately, in the last 10 years in Greece, the non-existent of the social insurance coverage, which was done by a previous uh, social security agency known as EGA in the past, is not covered by any today. So on the one hand, we have to identify these detrimental factors. We have to see uh, instances of violence in the workplace. But on the other hand, we cannot actually... Um, identify the morbidity caused. I hope that I was uh, specific. You were completely uh, clear and uh, I will come back to this. Uh, in parallel to all of these very important points raised by you, we see the questions that have come from the audience. And uh, first towards the organizers, I see that there is a question that mentions that it would be very interesting to have uh, in fact, an event about the future of work and youth. I think they could actually have this as food for thought for the near future to discuss this point. And I understand that this would be associated with the pandemic and the new facts shaped by the pandemic. And the question was from Mr. Zafiris Sidiropoulos. And from Mrs. Fesopi who I hope I'm pronouncing her name correctly, mentions that the harassment methods can be so uh, sly that it might take the victim months or years to understand that they're actually being subjected to harassment. How long does the victim have in order to uh, actually uh, take somebody to justice? And is it sufficient? Mrs. Bahalama, if you know, as, with respect to the uh, time period, or the other speakers, but I thought Mrs. Bakalama might actually know because she is a jurist. Could you please respond to this question? Well, the right to file a complaint uh, is not subject to any deadlines. It has to do with um, the deadlines for other um, occupational uh, workplace rights. Uh, usually, if it is, well, the big problem here is that uh, the slower this process moves, uh, the weaker the web of evidence uh, becomes. So this is the great difficulty because usually harassed victims, what they ask for is uh, compensation and indemnification. Uh, and it doesn't, it's not only a matter of time, there are certain deadlines, but it would be good for victims in order to be able to disengage from this environment. It would be good to have a very quick procedure. There is the access to the labor inspection, um, to the citizen's uh, ombudsman. Uh, when there is a case, the Labour Inspectorate may invite uh, the citizens' ombudsman, the citizens' advocate. So all this is within a framework of a five-year uh, period. 
Yes, well, okay, I hope that we've been able to answer more or less uh, the question. Uh, now, I have another question addressed to, to Ms. Bishop vis-a-vis -vis the European Directive Against uh, Discrimination. Uh, is it in force or not yet? Uh, yes, indeed, it is out of uh, 2002, and uh, it is um, enforced. But as you know, um, with the directive, it, it very much deep, the, the enforcement is quite different in the member states. Uh, I think that is uh, that is um, interesting, but it refers to something I think that we haven't addressed yet very much in the debate, but also the responsibility of employers for prevention, but also for action in case of harassment. And I think this is, this is very important because what we can see is, and if I refer back to, to my trade union experience as a trade union officer responsible for equality, um, I, I was involved in a lot of cases on company level and I think the procedures are often very similar. That first, it, uh, that women first try to avoid the situations. You don't experience this and immediately you think, uh, I'm going to address it somewhere. But very, very often in practice, uh, women experience harassment and then they first perceive it as an individual thing. And they try to avoid certain situations. Uh, or they often um, then, uh, if, if this doesn't stop, um, they try, for example, to change departments, uh, go to another workplace if this is possible. But the problem is that then these things continue. You know, uh, if they are not addressed uh, directly. And I think therefore it's, it's very important to create an environment that makes it easier for people um, to to complain to, to address to, and to discuss the situation as early as possible. Um, and and I think this should be also in the interest of an uh, of an employer. But what I can see in here, I think I agree with Ellie. The, the problem is if if you are, for example, in in a in a situation of economic crisis and you really fear any way to lose your job, it is much more complicated than to address issues like this um, than uh, I would say in, in, in halfway normal times. And I think, for example, what we realize also in this pandemia is that in many, many member, member states, we have a strong increase of violence at home. And that also um, the situation that many women are confronted with in this pandemia is not only that they are doing home office, um, but they have to do homeschooling very often at the same time. Um, and uh, that they are taking over more responsibilities and are uh, in in a, in a greater danger also because the living situation gets more and more complicated, especially if you are, for example, in short-term work um, schemes um, where you have less money in, in your family, um, pressure increases. So this is something that we really have to address when we discuss now measures for the recovery. Because I think that the situation in the last years deteriorated uh, all over Europe. I think it already did in Greece before. Uh, and to see that these, this needs to be uh, specially addressed. And I think also to have an evaluation how the situation is in the different member states. And I think uh, uh, here the, the work of the, of the Gender Institute is very important and the indicators they have 
and they evaluate every uh, every member state on on different uh, indicators. And I think violence and violence at work and harassment is one of it. Uh, and and to see where we might uh, need to take a special measures um, and and also to 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 raise the awareness that this should be also a key aspect in the recovery programs and the re recovery policies uh, Europe aims at uh, once we did overcome this pandemia, which at the moment we don't know when this uh, will be. Κυρία Μπίσοφ, μιας και είμαστε σε εσάς, θα ήθελα να σας κάνω και μια... Μιας Μπίσοφ, since there is a second question for you, I omitted to say that these questions come from Mr. Schildberg, the director of Friedrich Herbert Stiftung in Greece, and he is asking whether there are other political initiatives right now vis-à-vis uh, -vis directives against discrimination, against such type of um, harassment uh, that um, are currently being drafted or uh, debated or are in the pine pipeline. Thank you very much. Yes, yes, yes. Um, on one hand, uh, I am quite positive, I have to say, because the new commissioner Dali is uh, is very active uh, in this area. Uh, for example, we just had uh, recently a proposal we were for a long time waiting for on on pay transparency um, to to address a certain discriminations. On the other hand, for the first time since a long time, we again have a gender strategy for the next years. To, to have a coherent uh, approach here. And I think especially also for safe workplaces, if I look at the action plan to implement the social pillar, um, this, um, um, these issues are also covered. Um, and I think it will be very important also to see more concrete action and also proposals on the table um, to address it. And I have to say um, that if you look at safe workplaces, if, if you look at um, the question and the cost of, of, of mobbing, for example, and harassment to in connection to this, that we also have to see, because it is in all in the framework, the debate of the future of work, that in a digitalized world, we have also new risks that we that we uh, need to address and new, new challenges that uh, arise with different forms of work um, that we are doing. Uh, and also with new forms of mobbing and harassment, for example, via uh, social media um, and uh, and all of this that can be also related um, to the workplace or to to the private life um, of people that need, where we need to come up with new solutions uh, to to address this. And so I see on one hand, I think there will be new initiatives or they are already on the way, but I think we also uh, need to see new realities regarding the future of work and also to update legislation, for example, not only regarding discrimination and harassment, but also if I look at um, the field of information and consultation, uh, and representation that, uh, for example, if we have more people that work from platforms or from home, uh, how do we guarantee a safe environment? And how do we guarantee rights of inspections and, uh, and to address to, for example, uh, shop stewards or equal opportunity coordinators? Uh, or, or certain uh, institutions I can address to, which is, is easier if I'm 
at the workplace, but if people are, are working more and more from home, we need different and, and better adapted uh, legal frameworks also that cover this uh, new modes of working. Very important, uh, everything that you told us, and very important uh, when you talked about the new uh, work forms. But I think that we're opening up more points uh, than we can conclude with today, but it's food for thought uh, for the future. Now, I think it's also uh, going to be food for thought in public debate. Now, before I put another question to all panelists, which has come from the uh, streaming, I would like to share screen in order to see the results with respect to the question that we put to our audience about what they would like us to discuss in the near future. So, as you see, the impact of teleworking on employees is the number one, and it has 50% uh, of the votes. Then we have digitization and inequalities with 25%, and the platform and official economy has a further 25%. And last but not least is, in fact, the fight against climate change and employment. It appears that the current framework that we're all experiencing in recent times that have to do, has to do with the teleworking, and it monopolizes our interests, is in fact uh, something that uh, must be discussed in the near future. And I believe that the organizers will in fact uh, look at it and will come back with an equally interesting discussion. As I said before, there's a further question by Mrs. Anna Tibukli from the YouTube stream. She says, can we oblige organizations and companies to adopt an anti-mobbing policy starting from the civil service first and foremost? We don't have a lot of time at our disposal because we have to go to the conclusions. However, I would like to uh, give you the floor if you would like to take the opportunity to talk about this matter. And uh, you can take this opportunity to give a few concluding remarks before we have the conclusions of this uh, discussion. Mr. Rivas, shall we start by, with you? Yes, I believe that when we talk about an anti-mobbing policy, this is in fact uh, a policy that promotes uh, health at work, because uh, we shouldn't only look at mobbing, but we have to take on board all the factors that affect uh, the uh, working environment, psychosocial, physical, ergonomic, all the factors. There's a plethora of uh, detrimental factors within the workplace. Now, the legislative framework, which gives the possibility to promote health at work and safety at work exists. There is law 3850 already since uh, 2010. It is uh, following on the law 2856 of 1995 and so on and so forth. So the framework exists in terms of legislation. However, there are certain components missing. These do not help us to apply the legislative framework. The issue of recording these uh, detrimental factors or even occupational illnesses or um, accidents. I want to insist on the last two because these are measurable elements of such hazards. If we know them, we can talk about prevention measures. Without these data, we don't know what's happening actually on the ground in the workplaces in Greece. One more point, which is very important. The social and economic cost of professional hazard is huge. Three to five percent of the GDP of each country, according to specific studies. And unfortunately, in Greece, we have not gone about these estimations, so we don't have the data to be able to take stock 
of this occupational hazard and its impact on the Greek GDP. If we don't take specific measures, if we don't improve the conditions for working in the Greek workplaces, we will have things that will spiral out of control. Harassment and other such risks. We won't be able to address them in the manner that we should in order to really enhance the working conditions at the workplace. An important point that I want to raise is that we need to have information, especially when it comes to violence at the workplace, towards the workers and the employers. On behalf of the workers, they're afraid to speak out. And there's a lack of mechanisms for prevention and for tackling such behaviors. By way of example, there's a lack of medical and legal support of the victims of occupational hazards or the victims of violence at the workplace. This lacuna and this gap in the uh, prevention mechanisms is something that uh, could uh, be remediated by the trade unions themselves. They could create such structures that could address the lack of uh, such prevention mechanisms. And this is in terms of legal and medical support of the victims of such uh, hazards. And this would be one step forwards in the right direction in order to improve the conditions. Thank you, Mr. Drivas. Mrs. Varhalama, would you like to speak about the same matter? Indeed. I wanted to correct something. In your previous point, I thought about the year sexual harassment, but the year deadlines in the labor disputes are very short when there is the possibility of layoff. So there is a very short deadline within which the uh, um, employee has to uh, put forth their complaint. So uh, in three months in one case and six months in the other. So, uh, and that actually uh, impacts uh, the uh, um, rights accrued. And um, if they have not done so within three months, they lose the right. Now, with respect to the new point raised, it's what Mr. Drivas said. Everything is part of the health and safety context. We have to see whether these were a matter of general priority in social dialogue and whether it was a regulatory um, in point of interest for the state or not. Let me come back to what I said with respect to isolation. And now when we're working from home, we see that uh, um, a lot of, uh, or most of the employees work from home. They don't have, uh, in fact, access to the workplace or to um, the social environment and the trade unions do not have access to these uh, workers. It's a very difficult point uh, of communication. It's very difficult to communicate with them. And it's um, a very subtle matter because we need to build trust for people to open up and to talk about the details. So that is a great impediment. Now, how will the state actually save this and uh, resolve this? Uh, let's talk about the civil service. It has its own rules. But when you see uh, the matter of discrimination, who is... Uh, Who's, which civil servant is going to actually uh, go uh, and complain? <laughs> I mean, they will, in fact, be crushed uh, if they uh, have been harassed before this response. And there's also a great difficulty in the private sector. There had been an attempt to actually uh, resolve the matter of uh, moral harassment. And about 10 years ago, we had the obligation of the parties to actually uh, uh, give a specific, specific definition. So this is not an easy field to intercede in. The state could actually um, start uh, broaching the matter by uh, social dialogue. I think it's something that we can do within Greece and within Europe. But in a country 
where there is a breakdown between the state and uh, the representative of the workers, the um, progress in these matters will be very small. The dialogue structures in Greece in terms of equality and equal treatment have not been operating for the last 10 years. How can this state uh, move tangibly forward? We will ratify the uh, convention number 190, but uh, what are the appropriate measures in order to limit and to showcase this phenomenon? It's something that should concern us very, uh, very uh, much. Uh, that's without a doubt. Thank you, Mrs. Bakalama. Before I give the floor to Mrs. Bishop for her, her final remarks, I would like to read a few comments that have come from the audience, uh, from Mrs. Vaya Galano, that's talk does that of great interest would be uh, the work environment issue and how we have, uh, in fact, uh, inclusion and uh, this across the generations. Mr. Daiki Spiridobro says that the inability of the state to organize services that could act preventively in the workplaces and to tackle any type of work-related problems might very well have contributed to this um, indifference and collusion in these matters. Mrs. Dede mentions that it's very important to ratify Convention 190 of ILO with respect to the elimination of violence and harassment in the work, world of, of work. So all of these uh, have come now at the end of our debate. And one last comment by Mr. Schuttberg, the uh, director of the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung uh, uh, Athens. He says that the trade unions have to tackle a huge challenge in terms of the conditions uh, imposed by the pandemic. He says that communication is very difficult, communication with the employers, that is, and this, uh, in fact, undermines the confidence building. I hope that I haven't uh, made a mistake because I uh, read them out rather hastily in order to be within the time. So that is, uh, in fact, uh, a true race. Now, uh, Ms. Bishop, we're going to you for your concluding remarks. With respect to the first question and with respect to anything else you want to mention. And anything else that you would like to know before you close. Yeah, thank you very much. I would like to re-emphasize that the directive I referred to um, has uh, under Article 2, an important message to the member states because it says member states shall encourage in accordance with national law, collective bargain agreements and practice to take measures to prevent all forms of discrimination on grounds of sex, in particular harassment and sexual harassment in the workplace and to see that in especially difficult situations, uh, even more a responsibility to do. But what I will take back also with me is uh, we are pushing as uh, SND group in the European Parliament very much also in this action plan. The commissioner proposed uh, how to implement this social pillar, the social principles. We are pushing very much to include also a zero incident or zero accident approach regarding health and safety. And uh, I think uh, and I, this is very important and that hopefully we get a lot of political support so that this action plan will be adapted and this will be taken on board. And this could give a new impetus then because we will have the, the summit in Porto in May with all the governments, with all the member states, with the social partners on board to commit to this and also transfer it then in national activities here. And I think the question of mobbing and harassment is a key question of health and safety um, at the workplace. Uh, and, and hopefully also 
um, this will help to, to put this very important issue um, back on in, in the center of debate, because as, as was said by Mr. Drivers, and I already also mentioned it, and Eddie mentioned it, um, this is not only a question of a fair working environment, but it is also something that is important uh, for the whole of societies, because if we, if we do not address this, uh, it causes human uh, misery, it sicknesses, but also a lot of cost for society. And therefore, I think we are well advised to address this uh, in our policies and in this framework of recovery to make sure that this point is not left out or forgotten or thought that this is only of minor importance. So I think it's a very, very timely, timely debate. Uh, and also to see maybe um, can we publish more also good examples uh, in member states that are further ahead of us. This was something, this is from my German experience, always good, because uh, in, in, in questions of, of gender equality, Germany was always lacking behind far, far other countries like the Scandinavian countries or in France. Uh, and we profited a lot from European approaches or good practices in other member states. And on one hand, to have more legal pressure, but also uh, incentives by, by looking at good examples, maybe from other member states. Thank you very much. We thank you too, Ms. Bischoff, and with you, we thank all the speakers, the members of the panel. Now, before we move on to the conclusions, I'd like to encourage you to um, go to the live streaming uh, page um, and um, evaluate um, today's discussion. I hope that we've been able to um, um, maintain uh, your interest. Um, uh, you can fill in uh, the respective questionnaires, expressing your views. Uh, so having said that, uh, where you can find uh, the answer already posted in uh, live stream, I'd like to Welcome to our discussion, uh, Paulina Lamsa, who has been with us right from the beginning of this uh, discussion. Yes, uh, good afternoon. She is uh, the co-founder of Republic and one of the persons responsible for this um, debate, this discussion. So we move on to Ms. Paulina Lamsa to give us the conclusions. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I think that it's very difficult for one to draw conclusions because this discussion opened up a lot of uh, issues, uh, um, broached on different issues with, which should have been discussed maybe separately. Something I kept is a phrase Miss Bishop uh, used. Uh, uh, no labor, no workplace is an island. And I think that uh, the problems we mentioned are everywhere. The thing is how to find a new way to tackle them and render them our priority. The fact that both in Greece as well as elsewhere in other countries, there are voices of people denouncing um, uh, assaults, harassments, etc., is uh, really important because this helps us um, make it a priority. This is why we wanted to organize such a an event like today's event. Of course, uh, the conclusion we draw from this uh, discussion is that um, in order to tackle this, well, to tackle such a problem, this is a very complicated issue because it has to do with uh, the respect of the personality of each person because there is the legal aspect, which we saw is really important at the legal level, legislative level, directives and uh, decisions um, made at the level of the EU are quite positive, but this is not enough. This is not adequate. There is a 
legal framework. We do have uh, laws in Greece, etc., but uh, they need to be updated uh, and upgraded. Uh, there have been um, countries in Europe um, drafting new laws, trying to include them. the problem seen in the new forms of uh, labor, as is the case of uh, teleworking. Uh, it is important for us to examine all these um, laws uh, but the laws are not enough. We need to have regulations, um, the regulations for public services, um, uh, large corporate uh, structures, etc. Each country being different, uh, the conditions will change because as was already mentioned in Greece, we have um, SMEs in the majority. There needs to be a framework for uh, victims to turn to when something happens. Uh, uh, is there such a framework present in Greece? No. It's sh it should be. There should be one. There needs to be a whole different culture. This would entail uh, changes in uh, education, culture, uh, the media, uh, advertisement, uh, etc. And we also need to include the issue of um, mental health and physical health and the impact of um, such um, offenses on mental health. All this has to be taken into consideration. We're talking about rights, and this is a right to dignified work. We need to have respect for personality. All this needs to be safeguarded uh, in different ways. So I think that this um, discussion will need to be continued, uh, taken into consideration the proposals of all those who attended. This needs to lead us forward to share experience and hold a fertile dialogue within Greece if we are to make progress on that. So I think that uh, this um, discussion gave us food for thought and uh, we'll come back with um, similar initiatives. At this point, I'd like to thank uh, all the speakers, um, the Ms. Bischoff, um, Ms. Uh, to apologize. Uh, Mr. Trivas, uh, Ms. Varhalama, and of course, Ms. Kokinaki, who has uh, been our moderator, keeping up with the time. We'll come back. We thank you all for attending. We hope that you found it interesting. Thank you very much. Okay, a few words from me as well. I'd like to thank you all warmly. I feel that we've uh, touched upon many different issues that are equally important for our dialogue. The main uh, point being the new conditions of uh, teleworking. What I'd like to encourage you to do is, uh, since today we talked about uh, the dignity in um, the workplace, uh, I'd like to encourage you to visit uh, the new portal that has been established, the future of your work. Uh, you'll find it on Facebook, as was the case with the questionnaire. So, where you can find your com, where you can send your comments, uh, your questions. Um, you can also subscribe to get uh, um, the relevant newsletter, get information on future events. I'd like to thank the organizers um, for uh, honoring me by assigning me as the moderator. I'd like to thank uh, the three members of the panel, and I hope that uh, we have uh, been able to find fertile ground for discussion. Thank you all.